In a world now focused on the material and tangible, the majority of humans have no real understanding of their soul or divine nature. And yet the soul is what the physical body is built around. Or to understand our soul in a more simplified way, we can think of the body as the biological container of the soul and the mind as being seated in the soul. The divine pymander by Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus states, God is in the mind, the mind in the soul, the soul in the matter, all things by eternity. All this universal body in which are all bodies is full of soul, the soul full of mind, and the mind full of God. Paracelsus also describes the soul and its material container as such. The power of sight does not come from the eye. The power to hear does not come from the ear, nor the power to feel from the nerves. It is the spirit of man that sees through the eye and hears with the ear and feels by means of the nerves. Wisdom and reason and thought are not contained in the brain, but they belong to the invisible spirit which feels through the heart and thinks by means of the brain. All these powers are contained in the invisible universe and become manifest through material organs and the material organs are their representatives and determine their mode of manifestation according to their material construction. Because a perfect manifestation of power can only take place in a perfectly constructed organism and if the organism is faulty the manifestation will be imperfect but not the original power defective however to understand our soul we must first understand the source of our soul's creation the prime creator the prime creator is androgynous meaning both male and female the Gospel of the Holy Twelve explains this in the following verse. In God there is neither male nor female, and yet both are one, and God is the two in one. He is she, and she is he. The Elohim, our God, is perfect, infinite, and one. As in the man the father is manifest and the mother hidden, so in the woman the mother is manifest and the father hidden. Therefore shall the name of the father and the mother be equally hallowed, for they are the great powers of God, and the one is not without the other in the one God. The symbol of yin-yang also symbolically represents the two halves of the complete human soul. And just as it states in the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, we can see the symbol is relating. In the man, the father is manifest, and the mother hidden. So, in the woman, the mother is manifest, and the father hidden. We also see the prime creator symbolically represented as androgynous in the Hindu symbolism of the god Adana Rishvara. This artwork by the Kashmir sect of Hinduism is of Adana Rishvara and is depicting the creator as both the male god Vishnu and female goddess Lakshmi. In the Kabbalah texts, the prime creator is referred to as the Macrosopus, or the most ancient one, and these verses are some of the many from the Zohar, which explains the creator's androgynous nature. When the matter is hidden, the father and mother contain all things, and all things are concealed in them and they themselves are hidden beneath the holy influence of the most ancient of all antiquity. In him are they concealed, in him are all things included. The human soul is also created whole or androgynous from the prime creator. However, the soul then divides, and each half is incarnated onto the physical plane into the corresponding gender of its biological sheath. We see this process also explained in the Kabbalah texts of the Zohar. When a soul comes down from heaven, it is both male and female. The male aspects enter a male child and the female aspects enter a female child. If they are deserving, God will cause them to find each other and to join in marriage. This is true union. 
and again in this verse from the Zohar. No female or male soul is a complete human soul without the other. Male and female are halves of the same whole. What affects one, therefore, affects the other. This becomes most clear when it comes time for joining. The Sufi also explain this process as such. Out of the original unity of being, there is a fragmentation and dispersal of beings. The last stage being the splitting of one soul into two, and consequently, love is the search by each half for the other half, on earth or in heaven. And finally, Ram Das, a Sikh mystic, born in 1534 states, They are not said to be husband and wife who merely sit together. Rather, they alone are called husband and wife who have one soul in two bodies. Once a soul is created, it then continues to reincarnate into different biological containers as we descend through the ages of the great year. From the higher ages known as the gold and silver ages, to the lower ages with the bronze age and finally the lowest age of consciousness in which we now find ourselves, the iron age. Pythagoras explains this process of reincarnation as such. Souls never die, but always on quitting one abode pass to another. All things change, nothing perishes. The soul passes hither and thither, occupying now this body, now that. As a wax is stamped with certain figures and then melted, then stamped anew with others, yet it is always the same wax. So the soul, being always the same, yet wears at different times different forms. So now we understand the process of the soul's creation. We shall look at the hierarchy within that process and begin to have a more accurate understanding of the divine and mortal soul. As with everything in our fractal universe, there is hierarchy in nature's design, from the mineral to the vegetable, from the vegetable to the insect, and the insect to the animal, and the animal to the man. The creation of souls also follows this universal principle from mortal man to demigod and demigod to divine man and thus we see this related in the religious symbols of divine souls like jesus and mary and in the mythology regarding the lesser gods of ancient egypt hinduism ancient greece ancient rome and the norse and the celts and many more cultures which also represented the divine race in their stories and symbolism. These ancient cultures were not polytheists as many modern historians and theologians have mistakenly concluded. What their symbols and stories of the gods and divine man were relating to are the divine origins of the human race. Other symbolic representations of the divine race are the tribes of Israel, the four creatures, the cherubim, angels, Olympians, Arians, Atlanteans, Teutha de Danan, and the Immortals. When mankind were first seeded onto the physical plane, they were the first extension of the Prime Creator. They were unlike mortal men because they were the direct extension of the Creator and their souls were divine and therefore immortal. We see this seeding of the first divine male and female symbolized in the creation story of Adam and Eve. In this symbolic depiction of Eve being created from the rib of Adam, she is shown with a rounded belly, symbolizing the Christ child or demigod who was seated in her womb upon her soul's creation. Christian symbolism also relates the story of the demigod with Joseph, Mary and baby Jesus which is what the festival of Christmas and the story of Bethlehem also represents. Mary is called the Virgin Mother because the divine female was seated with the demigod upon her creation. This is also what the Holy Trinity refers to, the divine male, the divine female and the demigod. The divine male and divine female were created both ethereally and physically by the prime creator. Hence, they are divine. However, the demigod was seated in his divine mother's womb upon her soul's creation to be brought down to the physical plane from the creator in an earthly birth 
which is what makes this child a demigod. The demigod is the link between divine man and mortals and is what the symbolism of baby Jesus also represents. Other representations of the demigod can be found cross culture too. In ancient Egypt, we have baby Horus. In ancient Greece, it is Eros. And in Hinduism, the symbolic representation of the demigod can be found in the baby Krishna. Furthermore, Hermes explains the hierarchy of divine and mortal souls in this paragraph from the Corpus Hermetica, which also explains that though mortal man may not be born divine and immortal, he can attain immortality by the use of his intellect and understanding his divine nature and the responsibility he has as a soul living a virtuous life in alignment with universal law. Hermes goes on to state, the intellect, O Tat, is drawn from the very substance of God. In men, this intellect is God, and so some men are gods, and their humanity is near to the divine. When man is not guided by intellect, he falls below himself into an animal state. All men are subject to destiny, but those in possession of the Logos, which commands the intellect from within, are not under it in the same manner as others. God's two gifts to man of intellect and the Logos have the same value as immortality. If man makes right use of these, he differs in no way from the immortals. While all souls, both divine and mortal, are continually incarnated throughout the ages of the great year, the immortality of a mortal soul can only be attained at the end of the great year, at which time the actions of all souls throughout their incarnations through the ages will be assessed and the weight of their soul will deem them as either contributing to creation or working to destroy it by living out of alignment with universal laws. This organic process of the weighing of a soul also determines where a soul will be placed in the ethereal plane in between incarnations. The lighter a soul's weight, then the higher it will be placed on the ethereal planes, hence the symbolism of heaven and hell. However, at the end of the great year cycle, this process will determine the immortality of a mortal's soul. The Egyptian texts of the Bronze Book state, God will not destroy the transgressor of his law, for he will destroy himself. Each man ultimately decrees his own fate and receives his reward or punishment according to the law. What this means is that universal law or the divine laws of God are set in stone. So it is each soul who decrees his own fate by either living in alignment with those laws or not. There are two ways a mortal soul can achieve immortality, and this is by either living a pious and virtuous life in service to mankind, motivated by kindness, or through the seeking and attainment of divine truths. This is why at the beginning of the Gospel of Thomas, the first verse states, Whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Seneca the philosopher also goes on to explain the importance of seeking out the truth of our divine nature and not allowing ourselves to be caught up in the illusion that is the material world. Why is it that folly holds us with such an insistent grasp? Is it primarily because we do not combat it strongly enough? Because we do not struggle towards salvation with all our might? Secondly, because we do not put sufficient trust in the discoveries of the wise and do not drink in their words with open hearts, we approach this great problem in too trifling a spirit. But how can a man learn in the struggle against his vices an amount that is enough in the time which he gives to learning is only the amount left over from his vices? None of us go deep below the surface. We skim the top only and we regard the smattering of time spent in the search for wisdom as enough to spare for a busy man. This is why it is important to understand that as souls we exist in a cycle called the Great Year. In this cycle, there are higher ages in which we have more access to the Christ light or Holy Spirit, which is also sometimes referred to as manna from heaven. 
Just like the tides of the ocean ebb and flow, so does the ether, which is the medium that carries the Holy Spirit or manna to the physical plane. When the ether and Christ light recedes in the lower ages, we sink further into matter and forget our divine nature and divine man slowly loses his godlike appearance and superior abilities and eventually no difference can be found between a divine man and a mortal man. This is why in Hebrews 13.2 we are warned to treat all who we meet with kindness regardless of their status or wealth. Do not neglect to show kindness to strangers, for in this way some, without knowing it, have had angels as their guests. There are also many traditions in other cultures, such as in ancient Greece and the Nordic cultures, which state you should always show hospitality to a stranger, for they could be a god in disguise. This is symbolic for the inability to differentiate between a god and a mortal man in the lower ages. But as we are also told, all truths will be known, and everything hidden will be revealed, and when that time is upon us, it will matter how we treated those around us, even if they didn't appear to have an important status in society or be wealthy. In fact, Corinthians 1 verses 26 to 29 tells us that the divine man is likely to appear of less importance by worldly standards than others. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We also see this relayed in the verses from the Gospel of Philip. No one will hide a large valuable object in something large, but many a time one has tossed countless thousands into a thing worth a penny. Compare the soul. It is a precious thing, and it came to be in a contemptible body. When the pearl is cast down into the mud, it becomes greatly despised. Nor, if it is anointed with balsam oil, will it become more precious, but it always has value in the eyes of its owner. Compare the sons of God. Wherever they may be, they still have value in the eyes of their father. Plato also relays the story of the divine man sinking into matter and forgetting himself in the story of the Atlanteans, who are symbolic for the divine race. For many generations, as long as the divine nature lasted in them, they were obedient to the laws and well affectioned towards the God whose seed they were, for they possessed true and in every way great spirits. However, the Atlanteans became corrupt when the divine portion began to fade away and became diluted too often and too much with the mortal admixture, and the human nature got the upper hand. They then being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly, and to him who had an eye to see, grew visibly debased. The symbol of the angel can also refer to divine man, and fallen angels are symbolizing his fall into the lower ages when he too forgets himself. Plotinus also goes on to describe this forgetting of our divine nature and connection to our Creator in this verse from the six Enneads. What can it be that has brought the souls to forget the Father, God, and, though members of the divine and entirely of that world, to ignore at once themselves and it? The evil that has overtaken them has its source in self-will, in the entry into the sphere of process, and in the primal differentiation with the desire for self-ownership. They conceived a pleasure in this freedom and largely indulged their own motion. Thus they were hurried down the wrong path and in the end, drifting further and further, they came to lose even the thought of their origin in the divine. A child, wrenched young from home, 
and brought up during many years at a distance will fail knowledge of its father and of itself the souls in the same way no longer discern either the divinity or their own nature ignorance of their rank brings self-depreciation they misplace their respect honoring everything more than themselves all their awe and admiration is for the alien and clinging to this they have broken apart as far as a soul may and they make light of what they have deserted their regard for the mundane and their disregard of themselves bring about their utter ignoring of the divine admiring pursuit of the external is a confession of inferiority and nothing thus holding itself inferior to things that rise and perish nothing counting itself less honorable and less enduring than all else it admires could ever form any notion of either the nature or the power of god what i have endeavored to do in this video is share study notes with other students of the mystery teachings as well as open the door for those who are interested in seeking out an understanding of this ancient knowledge. However, it is for each student to step through that door and find the truth for themselves. Nobody can give anybody else the truth. It is something each of us must find for ourselves by investigating this subject further, using our own intellect and more importantly, trusting in it.